A popular YouTuber named Dan Bell explores abandoned buildings and then uploads that footage to his very popular This Is Dan Bell page that has over 500,000 subscribers. Unlike other urban exploration YouTube channels, Dan is not trying to create scary content. In fact, many of his most popular videos are taken in buildings that haven't even been abandoned yet, like in a Kmart that's shutting down and all the shelves are empty and he walks around and it's kind of eerie because it's this huge store that's now coming to an end, but again, it's not really scary. But amongst those popular videos, there is one that is horrifying, and it's called the Super Creepy Abandoned Asylum. One of the top comments on this video is from a verified YouTube account with over a million subscribers. They're called The Proper People, and they say, this may be the creepiest urban exploration video I have ever seen. The video opens with Dan coming up to this huge old house that looks like nature is reclaiming it with all the vines and grass and everything overgrown all around it. And for the first minute and a half, Dan is just quietly walking around the perimeter of this building. And you don't really know what it is besides obviously the captions given away, it's an asylum, but it doesn't look like an asylum. It looks like a random house in the middle of the woods. After about a minute and a half, Dan makes his way over to the side of this building and he sees there are some stone steps that go down into a door that clearly feeds into the basement of this building. Dan walks down the stairs, he opens the door and he walks into this hallway. And as soon as he goes in, because his camera had been filming in very bright sunshine outside, it takes a minute for it to focus on the hallway, which is totally dark. But once the camera focuses, you see all this old clothing strewn about on the ground and the paint is peeling off the walls in every part of the building. When Dan filmed this, he was not out loud narrating as he walked around the building. Instead, while he was editing the footage, he must have recorded himself doing a narration and that narration picks up as soon as he gets in the hallway and the camera has focused. He begins walking down this hallway and you hear under his boots the crunch of broken glass glass. And as he's walking, you hear Dan's voice say, this is a children's asylum that shut down sometime in the 1990s. It was briefly leased sometime in the 2000s, but for the most part over the past three decades, this building has been totally abandoned. After he gives this brief history, which sounds like he's done this dozens of times on other videos, he pauses and says, you know, something really strange happened while I was filming inside of this building. He heard what sounded like someone running around on the top floor of this building. He's used to going into abandoned buildings and finding creatures, animals running around. That was not unusual. And so instinctively, he assumes it's gotta be some animal that's taken up residence on the top floor. And so he doesn't worry about it. He ends up walking around the whole first floor before making his way upstairs. And he said when he got up there, he was expecting to see some animal or some sign of an animal living up there, but he didn't. He didn't see anything. It just looked like every other abandoned building. And after filming what he wanted to film, he eventually leaves the building and goes home. It wasn't until he loaded the footage onto his computer and began reviewing it that he noticed two specific instances while he was inside this asylum where clearly someone else is in the room with him. Dan speculates that perhaps a former patient has come back here and is living in one of the rooms upstairs. Here are the two segments from his video that show this kind of phantom person lurking in the shadows. In the first clip, keep your eyes on the door that is open leading downstairs. You'll see there is a shadow on the door that is being cast from whatever is standing at the top of the stairs just outside of our view. And at some point as Dan is filming down the hall, that shadow vanishes down the stairs. In the second clip, when Dan walks into the room, look to the back left-hand side of the room at the door, specifically at the open hole where there should be a doorknob. You will see there was very clearly someone looking through the hole at Dan, and when Dan films this person, they run away.
1982, a very outdoorsy teenage girl and boy who had recently started dating decided to go camping in Maine. Around 1 a.m. on the first night they were there, the girl wakes up because she has to go to the bathroom and she's about to unzip her tent when she stops because she hears some strange noises coming from outside their tent. It wasn't that loud, but it sounded distinctly like something was digging in the ground, but she really had to go and she figured, you know what, it's probably just some small animal or something. And so she begins to unzip the tent and there's a little bit of moonlight that night and there was a clearing outside of their tent. So the moonlight's pouring through. So she has plenty of illumination. And so she looks through this tiny hole and she can't believe what she sees. It is a grown woman squatting down about two or three feet away from their tent. Her back is to them. So she can't see that she's looking through the tent and she's feverishly digging into the ground in front of her. The girl literally falls backwards into her tent. She's so startled by what she sees and she lands on her boyfriend who immediately gets up and he's like, what's going on? And she goes, and she points at the little hole where she had unzipped the tent and she goes, look. The boy is confused, but he can tell his girlfriend is very serious. So he sits up quietly and he looks through the little opening in the door and he sees the digging woman. The boy recoils and looks at his girlfriend and he's like, what is going on out there? He takes a flashlight and she's telling him, don't do it. And he opens up the tent a little bit more and he aims his flashlight directly on this woman. And this gets her attention and she stops digging and she stands up slowly and she turns around and faces them and she's got no expression. She's not giving them any indication why she's there. She's not acting aggressive. She's not not acting scared. She's just completely neutral. And she stands there staring at them for quite a while before turning around and just walking away from their campsite. And after a little while, when they were pretty certain she was gone, they open their tent all the way. They go outside. They kind of scan around with their flashlights and she's nowhere to be found. And they go to where she was digging. And it's just this weird four inch deep hole in the ground. There's no rhyme or reason to why she was doing that. And so after sitting there wondering what they should do, they settled on, well, tomorrow we'll tell the park rangers that she was here and maybe they'll do something about it. And so feeling pretty confident that this woman's not gonna come back, they both go back into the tent, they zip it shut, they get in their sleeping bags, and they're about to go to sleep when they hear someone running towards their campsite. And they know it's this woman. They immediately unzip the tent and they look out. And now the woman's not digging anymore. She's rummaging through some of their stuff that's outside of their tent. And the way she's doing it, they described as monkey-like. She'd pick something up, look at it, and throw it over her head. She'd pick the next thing up, throw it over her head, back and forth, just throwing things behind her. And so the boy gets out and he shines a light on her and goes, you need to leave. And she doesn't react. She just keeps flipping through all their stuff until he gets pretty forceful and says, you need to leave right now. And at that point, she kind of stops and looks at him like, huh, what are you doing here? And then she gets up, turns around and walks away. Now the couple really doesn't know what to do because she's clearly willing to come back after being confronted but they stayed outside their tent for about 15 more minutes, shining their light and making lots of noise and treating her like she's an animal. And they're just trying to scare her away from the campsite. And after a little bit of time, they thought, okay, there's no way she comes back now because you know we were pretty aggressive with her this time and she seemed to really get it. They both do go back in the tent and as soon as they zip it shut, they hear her come running straight back to the site, like she was literally waiting in the wings for when they went back in the tent. And this time she runs back to the hole in the ground and she's just feverishly digging into the ground as fast as she can. And this time they come out of their tent and they're mad and they are screaming at this woman to get the F out of here, what are you doing? And this seems to kind of frighten the woman who gets up and she looks at them like, why are you yelling at me? And she runs away and it looked almost animalistic the way she was running away. Like she was feral. The boy and the girl are totally shaken up at this point. It's about 1.30 in the morning and this woman just keeps coming back to their site and they don't know what to do about it. So they turn on some lanterns and they turn on their flashlights and they decide we're just gonna stay outside until the morning. That way we know she doesn't come back and doesn't steal anything from us. But by about 3.30 in the morning, they've been outside for two hours. They're getting cold, they're super tired. The woman's nowhere to be found. And so they finally say, you wanna go back in and get some sleep? I, I think this time she's really gone. They get back in their sleeping bags and they go to sleep. They don't hear her again. The next morning when they get up and they unzip their tent, they look outside and all of their stuff has been thrown all over the campsite. And the hole in the ground that the woman had dug that was previously about four or six inches deep is now well over a foot deep. And they realize this woman must have been lurking in the shadows in the woods, watching them from 1.30 to 3.30 in the morning, that whole time they were out there kind of warding her off. 
She was just waiting, just watching them the whole time in the shadows. And as soon as they went into their tent, she must have given it a little bit of time, but then she ran right back over and she ransacked their site. But the strangest thing was after they looked through all of the stuff she had chucked around, nothing was missing. And there was some pretty expensive stuff that was laying out that she could have taken, but didn't. After they picked up their site, they went to the park ranger and they told them about what had happened but the ranger has no idea what to make of it. He's never heard of such a thing. And so the couple just leaves that day because they're not about to spend another night here. And to this day, they have no idea why this woman was running onto their site and digging into the ground and rummaging through their stuff. It was like she was just a wild animal. Missy Beavers was a wife, a mother of three girls, and a hardcore fitness instructor. She lived in Midlothian, Texas, and she taught a fitness boot camp out of a local church at least one day a week, every week. Missy was extremely bubbly and outgoing, and everybody seemed to really like her, and her personality really shined on social media, where she was an avid Facebook user, often posting multiple times a day, every day of the week. Missy would post information about upcoming fitness classes, either that she was teaching or that she was simply participating participating in. She would also post her own fitness regimen and her diet. She was just very focused on health. She also shared fairly personal things like pictures of her family and where they were going and what they were up to. And she left her personal cell phone right on her Facebook page. So clearly Missy was fine with kind of being out there. On April 17th, 2016, there was a weather report that came in that the next day there was going to be really, really heavy rain in particular in the morning. And Missy's class was scheduled for the next morning at 5 a.m. And she started getting calls and text messages from the people who were going to that class asking, is this class still going to happen? By 7.55 p.m. that night, so many people had asked about it that she decided to just put a public post on her Facebook page addressing the weather. And it just said, if it's raining, we're still training. No excuses. You are gladiators. On the post, she included directions of how to get to the church, where this class was going to be in the church, what time they were starting, and what they could expect. Later that night at 9.23 p.m., she did another Facebook post Post that said, going to bed, I have to get up tomorrow at 3.30. The next day at 4.16 in the morning, a street security camera picked up Missy pulling into the church's parking lot. Even though her class didn't start until 5 a.m., she liked to get there early to make sure the classroom was set up and to warm up a little bit and make sure she was super motivated and cheerful as soon as they walked in. The security cameras inside the church capture Missy walking in through the front doors at 4.20 in the morning. Then just before 5 a.m., the first couple of students arrived at the classroom and they walk in to find Missy laying on the ground, bleeding from her head, totally unresponsive. They call 911, police and paramedics show up, and as soon as they get there, they pronounce Missy dead. Initially, there was some speculation that she might have fallen and hit her head, but they noticed all these puncture marks in her head that looked intentionally inflicted, like someone had struck her. And later, when they reviewed the security footage from inside the church, it was confirmed that she definitely was murdered. Earlier that morning at 3.50 a.m., so 26 minutes before Missy arrives in the church parking lot, an unknown figure wearing police tactical gear from head to toe breaks into the church. From 3.50 in the morning when they first get inside the church to 4.20 in the morning when Missy walks through the front doors, this unknown figure just kind of strolls casually up and down the halls of this church. It looked like they were carrying a hammer or perhaps a crowbar, and periodically as they're kind of casually walking down the hall, they would turn to a window of a door and they would break it with whatever they're holding in their hand, and then they would just keep walking on. Like there was no reason for them to break the window, they're just bored. And this was actually an important point that police would make about this footage. This person walking around does not appear to want to vandalize the church. I mean, they're breaking a couple windows, but they could have done a lot more damage to the building, and they didn't. They don't appear to be looking to steal anything. And in fact, later, police would confirm that nothing was stolen. What it looks like they're doing is just kind of wasting time. Like they have some clear objective for being here, but they can't do it quite yet. They're waiting for a trigger of some kind. And it would turn out that that trigger was Missy walking through those doors at 4.20 in the morning. As soon as Missy made her way into the classroom, the assailant followed her and proceeded to beat her to death with whatever they were holding in their hand. 
By the time police arrived, a little after 5 a.m., the suspect was long gone. Initially, police believed it was gonna be fairly easy to identify who killed Missy. The person on camera wearing the tactical gear had a very distinctive gait with their feet turned out and they walked with a bit of a limp and they had very slouched posture. And the police figured as soon as we put this surveillance footage out in the public domain, someone's gonna come forward and say they recognize this person. But despite the hundreds of leads that poured in from people after watching this video saying, oh, Oh yeah, I know this person. Well, the police checked into all of them and they all checked out. Everybody had an alibi. And so years later, the police are still not able to identify who killed Missy or why. And so her case remains unsolved. Here is the security footage of Missy's killer casually walking around the halls, aimlessly smashing windows and opening doors, just waiting for Missy to show up. In 2015, an experienced outdoorsman named Bob, along with his wife, his young daughter, and their two German shepherds, decided to go camping in a remote part of Northern Oregon. When they arrived at the site, Bob began setting up the big family tent for everyone to sleep in, and his daughter said, hey, do you mind if I sleep in the spare two-man tent that we always bring with us. Bob and his wife deliberated for a minute, but said, you know what, that's fine, but you gotta bring Guts. That's one of the German shepherds. Guts needs to sleep with you because he's gonna be your protection. So that night, after some s'mores around a campfire, Bob's daughter, along with Guts, retreat to their two-man tent, and Bob, his wife, and Leah, the other dog, retreat to their tent. That night, Bob wakes up suddenly to what sounds like footsteps outside of his tent, and he looks to his side, and his wife is still in the tent with him, and so is Leah, the other dog, and he listens really closely, and he can hear his daughter is snoring, and he can hear the sound of Guts breathing. So his whole family is accounted for, but he still hears these footsteps, and they don't sound like light little scampering sounds like you might expect from a squirrel or some small critter. They sound heavy like a big creature is roaming around their campsite. But Bob's dogs are really keyed in to protecting their family. And since Guts and Leah are not up going crazy about whatever's out there, he figures, you know what? It's gotta be an elk or something and it's not gonna do anything to us. So Bob ultimately just goes back to sleep. The next morning, Bob gets up and everybody's just fine. There's no sign of any intruders in their campsite. And so that only confirms to him that, yep, it was just some harmless animal kind of walking around the wilderness because we're in a pretty remote area. That morning, they decide to go for a walk down the road that was right next to their campsite. And so they take the dogs, they start walking, and they make it a couple hundred feet down this road when all of a sudden Guts sees something or hears something and takes off sprinting down the road and turns down this little access road that branches off of the road they're on into the woods. And Bob is thinking, oh no, there, there's a campsite down there and this big German shepherd's gonna bound up on them and something bad's gonna happen. And so Bob, his heart's racing, he starts taking off after Guts. He goes down the access road and he finds Guts stopped right outside of a campsite. But there doesn't appear to be anybody in the campsite. But there's a tent, there's a cooler, there's a table, there's all the things you would expect at a campsite, just no people. So Bob runs up and he grabs Guts and he yells out reflexively, hey, I'm really sorry, he's totally harmless. I don't know what he saw, hey, we're leaving. But then before he leaves, he realizes on the tent, there's this big scratch through it, like it's been cut open and curiosity gets the better of him. And so he kind of walks up, keeping an eye out in case he's wrong and there are people still here. But as he gets closer, he realizes there's definitely no one here. This site is abandoned because he's looking around and all of their stuff has just been ransacked. There's scratch marks on everything like animals have clearly come through here. And Bob, who is an avid outdoorsman, he knows how much some of their equipment cost. And he's thinking, why would anyone abandon this really expensive tent or this really expensive cooler? And as he's thinking about that, he turns and he sees there's a propane tank, a solid metal propane tank that has been completely flattened, but there's no tree that's fallen nearby. There's no source 
There's no way that could have been flattened. So he's definitely unsettled by this, but ultimately he decides, you know what? I'm gonna take my family, go back to my campsite. I'll just call the park rangers. They can come down here and they can figure out what this is. Later that afternoon, Bob and his family are back at their campsite, just a couple hundred feet away from this abandoned campsite. And at one point, his wife gets up to go use the bathroom. She walks about 70 feet away behind a tree and she squats down. And then all of a sudden, she gets up and starts running back towards camp. And Bob sees this. He turns and sees her running towards him. At the same time, Guts gets up and starts sprinting towards her. And so Bob's thinking, what the heck is going on? Bob turns to his daughter and says, stay right here with Leah. And Bob gets up and starts running towards his wife. And Guts, at this point, has run to his wife and past his wife. Guts has run way into the woods. And as Bob is running up to his wife, he's like, what's going on? Why are you running? What's going on? And she says, I don't know. I just had this horrible feeling someone was watching me. And when I turned, I already saw Guts running towards me and it scared me. And so that's why I'm here. And he's like, look, go with our daughter and with Leah. I'm gonna see what's going on. And so his wife leaves and Bob draws his pistol and he starts walking out towards where Guts has now stopped. Hair raised, growling, it's yapping and barking at something in front of it. And Bob's looking and he, and he can't see anything. Thing. And finally, after not being able to figure out what the heck is going on, he just takes guts and goes back to his campsite. When Bob got back to his campsite, he wanted to leave and his wife wanted to leave. His daughter didn't really know what was going on, but the attitude was, we want to leave. However, it was getting late and they had a bunch of stuff they would need to pack up. And it was going to be a real ordeal trying to do that, especially without any light. So they decide, okay, we'll stay one more day and we're going to leave first thing in the morning. In Bob's head, he's thinking, okay, I heard weird footsteps outside. You know, we have this abandoned campsite nearby that's been thrashed up in the flattened propane tank. And now my wife is running away from something and Guts is seeing strange things in the woods. Like there's a lot of weird stuff going on. And he decides he's gonna set up a tripwire all the way around his campsite using a rope tied at about eight inches off the ground where along the rope would be little pieces of metal that would clang together. So if anything touched the rope, it would make the metallic clinking sound then it would alert Bob that someone's here. And so Bob goes over to the edge of the site where there's an obvious starting point for this tripwire and he bends down to tie the rope and he realizes, oh my God, someone's already done this. There is another tripwire that's already been built around the outside of our campsite. It's just been cut, it's been broken. Like it doesn't work, but it's here. Someone else who was at this campsite felt concerned enough about whatever was in the woods that they already had this idea. Bob didn't even tie his perimeter. He just drew his gun, told his family, get in the truck, and he stayed up all night protecting his family in the truck. As soon as the sun came up, they packed up and they got the heck out of there. Bob is convinced that there is something out there in the woods in Northern Oregon that was walking around their campsite at night, that's scaring their dogs, that's stalking them basically and watching them from a distance. And probably whatever is out in the woods is the same thing that caused the previous group to set up their own tripwire. And it's also probably the reason the other campers at the other campsite were willing to abandon their nice equipment to get the heck out of there because they are not messing with whatever the heck is out in those woods. In March of 2015, 68-year-old Tamara Samsonova was having renovations done to her home in St. Petersburg, Russia. A friend of hers, 79-year-old Valentina Ulanova, had heard about Tamara's renovations, and she approached her and said, do you want to stay with me while that's getting done? Tamara was very thankful, immediately said yes, and as soon as she moved in, she immediately started picking up the slack by cleaning up the house and doing the dishes and made sure she always cooked food for her friend because she wasn't able to pay rent. After a couple of weeks, the renovations on Tamara's home were complete, but Tamara didn't want to leave. She was really enjoying living with Valentina, and so she asked Valentina would it be okay if she stayed a little bit longer. Valentina was a little bit reluctant, but did ultimately say, okay, that's fine. A couple of months go by and Tamara is showing no sign that she plans on leaving Valentina's home anytime soon. And Valentina is getting increasingly frustrated with that reality. Finally, in late July, 2015, Valentina confronts Tamara and says, you gotta go. And Tamara just says, no, I'm not leaving. This causes a huge fight 
But at the end of it, Tamara still doesn't leave. So for a couple of days, the women just do not speak to each other. The silence is finally broken on July 23rd when the women get into a fight about some empty cups in the sink that one of them was supposed to clean, but they didn't. And they fought about whose responsibility it was to do the dishes. And then of course, the whole subject comes up again of Valentina saying, you shouldn't even be here, you need to leave. And Tamara's like, no, I'm not gonna leave. And so another big blowout fight happens. But at the end of this fight, Tamara finally concedes and says, okay, I get it. I need to leave, just give me a couple of days and I'll be out of your hair. Immediately the tension is gone in the room, they're no longer fighting and Valentina is happy that she's finally gonna get her apartment back and Tamara says, look, I'll make us dinner tonight, I'll go out and get some food. Tamara leaves the apartment and goes to a pharmacy and gets a whole bunch of sleeping pills and then she gets the ingredients to a particular salad that she knows Valentina really likes. She goes back, she starts making dinner and as she's making the salad, she crushes up the sleeping pills and mixes the powder with the salad dressing and gives that to Valentina. And Valentina, who's very hungry, eats the whole salad and doesn't notice anything is wrong. As soon as Tamara was sure Valentina had eaten the entire salad, Tamara just goes up to her room and goes to bed. A couple hours later at about two in the morning, she goes back down to the kitchen and she sees Valentina is passed out on the ground. Tamara goes up to her and sees that she's still breathing, which was a disappointment because she wanted her to die from taking all these sleeping pills, but it doesn't matter. She takes out her hacksaw that she had borrowed from the neighbor earlier in the day and proceeds to butcher Valentina. And she makes special care as she's cutting her into pieces to remove her lungs and not damage them because Tamara had a taste for human lungs. It was actually her favorite food. She took Valentina's head and she put it into a big pot of water and began boiling that to eat it. The rest of her was cut up into as small of pieces as she could get them and then wrapped in a shower curtain and placed in various bags. As Valentina's head and lungs are being cooked on the stovetop, Tamara begins making dozens of trips from the apartment down the stairs, out the front door, all the way down to the lake that was near their property where she would dispose of the body parts before coming back and getting more. Valentina's hips and legs were apparently too heavy to haul all the way down to the lake, so she took them to a nearby forest. Tamara's final trip sees her carrying a big silver pot inside of which is Valentina's head, or at least whatever is left of it after Tamara was done eating most of it. Four days later on July 27th, a young couple that was living in the same apartment complex as Tamara and Valentina were out for a walk with their dog out near that lake. And as they're walking, their dog takes off running and stops in front of this huge bag that it's sniffing and pawing and trying to open. And the owners of the dog try to call it back, but they can't get it to get away from this bag. And so the owners walk over and they kind of poke the bag. They can see it's pretty heavy and they open it up and they find a human torso and it's Valentina's. When the police show up, the first thing they do is they go to Valentina's apartment and they're surprised to find Tamara living there. And they're kind of sensitive with her and they say, your friend, your relative, relative uh, was just found deceased and we need to look around the apartment. Tamara was completely indifferent. She did not care. They had just discovered her body and she didn't care that they were searching the apartment. It was like she knew someday this was going to happen. During the search, the police officers quickly find blood all over the bathroom and in the kitchen. They even find the hacksaw she used that's got blood on it. And they find Tamara's diary that's sitting next to this book about black magic. And the police are horrified when they see that the diary contains meticulous notes that Tamara had kept of all of the ritualistic killings she had perpetrated over the past 20 years. And there was 14 of them. And almost all of them were motivated by Tamara's desire to cast spells that she apparently was reading about in these black magic books she had. And virtually all of these spells required human flesh or other human components. And so she would kill these people, she would use their bodies to cast these spells, and then afterwards she would consume them. Not because that had anything to do with the spell, but because she liked the way people tasted, in particular human lungs. The police arrest Tamara, who doesn't put up a fight. She says, yep, you got the right person. I did all this. While Tamara was on trial, she seemed like she was in a great mood. She told the judge, I hope you give me a really severe punishment. I expect to die in prison. She was seen blowing kisses to reporters. It was like she was just totally out of touch. Or maybe she literally knew this was going to happen and just didn't care anymore. Tamara, who would be nicknamed the Granny Ripper by newspapers over the course of this trial, was given a life sentence, and to this day, she is still sitting in jail. Here is the surveillance footage of Tamara disposing of Valentina's body, as well as some shots of Tamara during her trial.
In 2004, wildland firefighters were called into a forest in central Idaho to combat an emerging fire. By the time the crew arrived at this forest, it was clear this fire was spreading a lot faster than they anticipated. As a result, Mike, who was the assistant superintendent, basically the second in command of this particular crew, he said he was going to hop on the ATV and drive off way ahead of them to see if they needed to spread out farther to stop this fire. So Mike hops on an ATV and he takes off down this ancient looking logging road that probably hasn't seen a vehicle or a person in decades. Mike had made it about a half mile down this trail when he noticed out of the corner of his eye a bobcat was running perpendicular to him straight out of the forest as if it was going to cross the road about a hundred feet in front of him. Mike comes to a stop and thinks this bobcat doesn't know I'm here. It probably is not used to seeing people. It's going to come out into this trail, see me, get spooked and run away. But instead this bobcat runs directly into the middle of the road, turns and faces Mike in a very aggressive posture. Mike is shocked at what he's seeing because he knows bobcats are notoriously elusive and they're nocturnal. So for this thing to be out in the daytime and to be intentionally blocking his path and standing there aggressively like it's going to attack him was so out of the ordinary. So the two of them are just looking at each other, not moving for about 10 seconds until this bobcat opens its mouth and then begins screaming like a person. It did not seem like the right sound for what he was looking at. He said more than scary, it was just intensely weird. And just as quickly as this bobcat has arrived, it stops screaming, turns and runs to a tree, sprints up the tree and climbs onto this branch that happens to be perched right over the trail he's on. And Mike's looking up at this bobcat that's right over this trail, and he knows if I'm gonna continue going down this trail, I have to go under this screaming bobcat. Although totally freaked out, he knew he needed to keep going down this trail. And he's thinking to himself, you know what? This bobcat is probably just scared of me. And that was its reaction, as bizarre as it was. And so he throws his ATV in gear and he starts slowly moving down the trail, the whole time keeping his eye on the bobcat, making sure it doesn't show any sign like it's gonna leap off onto him. And as he got closer and closer, he just gunned it and sped underneath the branch. And luckily it didn't jump down on him. And as he got a little bit farther away, he turned up to look and the bobcat had turned around and was still watching him very intently sitting on this branch. Mike makes it about another half mile down the road before he sees something else that's very strange. He sees a cabin. It's this little tiny cabin that's tucked away in the woods. And he's thinking to himself, I'm on federal land. There aren't supposed to be any private structures here. And he figures, even if this is illegal, I do need to stop and make sure no one's in there because there's this huge fire coming this way. And so he parks his ATV and he starts walking off the trail towards this cabin. And as he gets closer, he can tell it's not only a very old cabin, but it's almost certainly abandoned because he can see all these slats that have been put over all of the windows like it's been boarded up. But when he got up close, he noticed something strange. The door itself into this cabin was not boarded up and the doorknob was missing and in its place was this shiny silver chain link that was thread through the opening where there should have been a doorknob around a wooden post that was right outside the door. Basically a, a makeshift lock because there was no doorknob to it. And he's thinking how weird it is that in the middle of this forest on an old ancient logging road that clearly no one goes down where bobcats are running around freely that there would be this new chain here which indicates someone must have been here recently. And so he bends down to look through the space that was still there from where the doorknob should have been. And he looks inside and he can't really see anything. And so he takes his flashlight and he shines it in and he can't believe what he's looking at. There's all this furniture inside this tiny little cabin in the middle of nowhere and it's all upside down. And he's just totally creeped out. So he puts his flashlight away and kind of backs up and he starts walking back towards the road and he can't help it, but the whole time he's looking over his shoulder back at the cabin, like someone's gonna emerge from outside of this cabin. He gets to the road and by the time he's there, he's running. He jumps on his ATV, he whips it around and he starts blazing back up the logging road back towards his crew. And when he turns the corner to where that bobcat was, he sees there is now a Native American woman standing in the middle of the path She's wearing this tattered white nightgown. She's barefoot and she's standing in the same spot. He saw that bobcat and she's looking at him as if she's expecting him, like she's been tipped off that he's gonna be here. And he stops about a hundred feet away from her and now he's officially freaked out. He's still looking over his shoulder towards that cabin because now everything is just totally weird to him. And before he has a chance to do anything, this woman lets out a scream, a blood curdling scream that is identical to the bobcat's scream. 
And so Mike is totally unnerved by this. Everything about this day has really gone sideways as this woman is screaming at the top of her lungs. And then suddenly she stops. Mike's still just standing there like, what's going on? And she runs to the same tree the bobcat had climbed earlier. And she climbs up this tree and gets onto the branch where the bobcat was and perches like an animal on the branch looking at Mike. And now just like the bobcat, Mike is going to have to drive right underneath this woman who is perched over the trail. And so he throws his ATV in gear and he starts driving and he's staring at this woman and now her mouth is just open like she's about to scream again. And as soon as he got close, he gunned it and went right underneath her. And he turned around after he got some distance away from her and she's still on the branch, now turned around facing him as he drives away. He goes back, he tells the crew what he saw and as much as they all wanna go back and see this woman and see this cabin, they know they can't, they gotta fight this fire. And so ultimately they do that and then they leave. A couple of days later, Mike was in a bar in the town right near the forest they had just been in fighting that fire and Mike had seen the woman in the cabin and he struck up a conversation with a local and he said hey do you know of any buildings that are in that section of the forest and the guy kind of laughed and he was like you know the only building I ever heard of out there was apparently some cabin where some crazy lady thought of herself as a witch and she apparently had a bobcat for a pet and so we as kids were just told to stay away from there so Besides that, I don't know. So that's gonna do it, guys. Let me know in the comments